So, uh, basic entomology. So the basic understanding of insects and insect relatives is what we will be doing here today. And so some of the objectives for the program will be to identify what an insect is. How do you distinguish insects from all the other cre creatures that are out there? Uh, be familiar with insect relatives, and we'll go through those pretty quickly. Understand some of the complexities of insects. You know, a lot of people don't give insects the credit that they deserve. They think they're just these simple little primitive things running around out there causing problems all the time, when in fact they are an integral part of all ecosystems across the world. And they do a lot of services via uh, ecological importances. Have a basic understanding of the different types of insects that you can encounter. And what I mean by that is butterflies versus bees versus beetles versus fly flies, etc. Um, so that when an insect comes in for identification, you can look at it and have a general idea, well, that looks like a beetle or that looks like a butterfly. So you have a general idea where you start in attempting to identify it. Gain an appreciation for their qualities, their benefits, their destructiveness, and that last statement there, their reason for being. Okay? And that's one of the challenges a lot of people have for the insects and their relatives is understanding that they are there not for your benefit. They are there because they belong. They are part of that ecosystem. They're doing a service in that ecosystem. Whether that service is appreciated by you or not, um, their reason for being isn't simply to serve you. And um, people have a, a bit of a challenge with understanding that. Uh, they, you know, some have the philosophy, the only good insect is a dead one. Um, and then there's certainly others that go to the other extreme where every insect should be preserved and never touched and left to do whatever they want to. Now, most of us should some fall somewhere in between uh, because they can be very destructive or they can be dangerous to some individuals such as with the bees, wasps, and hornets. The venom that they generate um, and defend themselves with can be very, very dangerous to some individuals that have allergies toward those venoms. So, with that, here's a question I always ask the group. Can this critter predict the weather? And the answer to that is absolutely not. <laughs> now, think about that. How in the world would a caterpillar that's growing up in the middle of summertime know what the winter is going to be? Um, they, they just can't. Uh, and so any variations that we see in the woolly bear's color um, banding, it's genetic um, variability within the population. Uh, so everything's determined by the genes of that, just like everything in us are determined by our genes. And just like in the human population, where we all don't look exactly like one another, we have the basic outline of what everybody should look like. Now, likewise with insects, there is also genetic variability. And so there's going to be changes or slight variations in the patterns that appear on their body. On the other hand, some may find some of these woolly bear caterpillars that may be entirely black, or they may be entirely orange, or they may be in an entirely different color. And so how do we explain that? Well, we explain that by you're probably looking at different species. So there's multiple species that have similar looking caterpillars, and it's not simply they're predicting that it's gonna be a really nasty winter <laughs> or not. So about the only thing that that caterpillar can tell you weather-wise is if it's looking really good, it's big and chunky, it just went through a really nice summer condition where there were lots of resources available to it, and it grew very well. It can tell you the past, it can't tell you the future. All right, entomology, the study of insects. And um, the insects are a very specific group. However, because insects 
are uh, very similar to a number of their relatives. They're small, creepy, crawly, found in a garden, found outside, etc. cetera. Um, there are other, other creatures that we have to look at, 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 at least uh, briefly, so we can distinguish them from the insects. And that again comes down to, if you are given one of these creatures, you have to know whether it's an insect or not, so you're going down the right path when it comes to identification. Insects are animals, and being animals, they are going to have a lot of similarities to ourselves in terms of internal function, what we require from the environment, uh, food, shelter, and enjoyable places to be, etc. And they're going to be in very similar environments with us, so we are going to come into contact with them on a regular basis. And they may vie with us for some of the same resources from that environment, which brings us into conflict with them, or maybe I should say, um, they're co we're con coming in conflict with what they're trying to do rather than what we're trying to do because there's a lot more of them than there are of us, all right? Um, we, when we start looking at the classification of the insects, just like with the plants and all the other organisms that you have looked at through this training program, we classify them out into categories of great categories down to very specific categories. In that nomenclature system of kingdom, phylum, um, uh, class, order, family, uh, genus, and species. The phylum to which the insects belong is the arthropoda. And the arthropods is a huge group. There's all kinds of critters that are included in that. And they do share some very common characteristics amongst themselves, such as the term arthropoda specifically means the joint-footed animals. And this is in reference to all of these animals are going to have jointed appendages. And we have jointed appendages as well, but they are derived from a different origin than what we see on the arthropods. And in addition to that, you can see um, all of the arthropods have a hard shell on the outside of the body. And that hard shell is their skeleton. So it's called an exoskeleton, a skeleton on the outside of the body. We have an endoskeleton. Our skeleton is incorporated in the tissues of our body. A big difference between an exoskeleton and an endoskeleton is our endoskeleton is a living skeleton, which means it grows with our body. And if a bone gets broken, it has the ability to mend itself because there's living cells within those bones. The exoskeleton, on the other hand, is a non living structure. Once it is formed, that's the shape it's going to be. If it gets damaged, it cannot repair itself, and it doesn't grow with the body. Think about that. Don't insects have to grow? They hatch out of an egg at a really tiny size, and some of these arthropods can get to very large sizes. If its exoskeleton can't grow with its body, what has to happen every so often? It has to shed it. It has to go through a molting process. And so, unlike ourselves, when we're growing, we kind of grow gradually in size from the infant to the adult before our growth stops. In the arthropods, it's going to be more of a um, staccato type of growth. It'll be the same size for a period until it reaches a point where it has to get bigger. Then it molts into the next size. And then it goes along at that size for a period until it has to grow again. It molts. So it's kind of a stepwise progression in that development. And each time it gets larger, it is going through a molt to get there. And eventually, they too, for the most part, reach an adult size and they stop growing. There are exceptions, especially in some of our marine types of arthropods, like lobsters. Lobsters can keep growing through their entire life. 
They have multiple molts through their lives. And some lobsters can get phenomenally huge in the oceans. Insects on dry land kind of stop. And we'll see some examples of that. So that, that exoskeleton does all the same things as an endoskeleton. Um, it provides physical protection. Um, it, it protects these soft internal organs. It provides um, a place for muscles to attach. So it can move all those jointed appendages that it has. Um, it also provides some chemical protections. And what I mean by that is where do most insects live? The ground. On the on the ground. They they live out on terrestrial landscapes. What's one of the biggest challenges any organism has to live in the terrestrial environment? Moisture control. Moisture control, absolutely. Preventing excess moisture from getting into the body and more critically, preventing loss of moisture to the environment. And that exoskeleton provides protection against that. How does it do that? One of the layers on that exoskeleton is a waxy coating. All right, so that wax it repels excess water and holds the appropriate amount of water to the interior as long as that waxy layer is intact. Now, now when it goes through that molting process, what's it going to lose with that old exoskeleton? it's going to lose that waxy layer. So during the time of getting rid of the old exoskeleton and forming the new one, it's very vulnerable to desiccation. It can lose a lot of water. So typically, that molting process is carried out in some protected environment so that it can avoid losing excess moisture. Also, when it doesn't have a hardened exoskeleton, it can't move very well because the muscle attachments are weak and it's very vulnerable to physical damage. Um, so that's one of the disadvantages of the exoskeleton, having to molt it on a regular basis. Other characteristics of the arthropods, they, they all have segmented bodies. In other words, there are repeating units down the length of the insect's body. The ancestor of all of the insects was a pretty amorphous type of organism that had multiple repeating units down the body. Over time, an adaptation to different habitats, different roles, etc., um, those segments have been organized into functional units. And those functional units are called the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And we can still see that segmentation on that body. And they are bilaterally symmetric. So they have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And one of the advantages of having a left and right-hand side is they can work against one another to perform different tasks. All right, so um, that right there is an example of a shed exoskeleton. And does everybody know what that exoskeleton is from? A cicada. a cicada. And we find them every summer on all kinds of different objects because the first part of that cicada's life was spent underground, connected to a plant root, feeding on that plant. Now, we never have any concern as to how much feeding they're doing because we've never documented any impact on the plant. Now, once it's gone through a multitude of molts underground, it will dig its way up out of the soil, climb up a vertical object, grip on, and it splits down the back of that exoskeleton so the adult insect can emerge. Um, so, here's another example of that. Now, there's a newly emerged adult, and there's its last nymphal instar. This one happens to be the periodical cicada. A couple of years ago, we had a brood emergence here in Hardin County, and that is from Lawrence Woods here in Hardin County. 
Uh, also notice the color of the adult that came out there. It's white. It looks like maybe an albino. It's not. One of the processes of pr producing a new exoskeleton is it has to be hardened and it has to be colorized for it to finish its completion. Um, so that white will disappear. The wings will be amber in color. The body will be coal black or tar black in color. Um, you can see the eyes are already red and that's a characteristic of the periodical cicada. So um, some people get excited when they find a, an arthropod in the middle of that molting process because they think they have found a rare albino <laughs> example of that type of organism. They'll bring it into the extension office saying, oh, you have to see this. They'll pop open the container and it'll be a standard, plain, ordinary insect or other arthropod because in the interim of collecting it and getting it here, it has finished its coloration process. Oh. Oh, um, segmentation, there's a caterpillar of uh, a moth and you can see that repeating units down the length of the body. So even in modern arthropods, you can still see that segmented <coughs> characteristic of the overall insect. Running through some examples of other arthropods that we can encounter, <coughs> not necessarily in Ohio, but at least in the United States, um, includes the horseshoe crab. Uh, this is a very ancient animal. It has been around for millions of years with very little change in its structure. Um, it does belong to the Arthropoda. Um, a subphylum that it belongs to is the Chelicerata, and that's a fancy way of saying what kind of mouth parts it has. Um, and it belongs to a class, almost all of its own, the Merostomata. Um, from the above, you can't really see all of those arthropod characteristics other than if you tap on that shell, it, you will be able to tell it's a hardened exoskeleton. And it's not until you flip it over and look at the undersides that you see the um, multiple pairs of appendages. Um, you can see the segmentation of the abdomen there. Um, so all of the arthropod characteristics are present on that animal um, to say that it is truly within the same phylum as the insects. We are very blessed here on the East Coast of the United States because horseshoe crabs only live on east coasts of continents. You go out to the west coast and you're never going to see a horseshoe crab. But on the east coast, they are present. And part of that has to do with the water currents. Um, and the water currents up the east coast are much warmer than the water currents down the west coast. Um, so the environment's not right for them on the west coast. Uh, so, living here on the east, you have the opportunity to see horseshoe crabs along the eastern seaboard. From there, um, another uh, member or another class under the Chelicerata um, is the Arachnida. And as a representative there, I have a tarantula. I will tell you, we don't have tarantulas here in Ohio, at least not native tarantulas. Um, they can be purchased at pet stores, and people do keep them as pets in their homes. Occasionally, they do escape. Um, so if somebody brings in this very large spider and says, is this a tarantula? It may very well be a lost pet. Um, that Or Junior brought it home to Mom and said, look what I bought at the pet store. And she said, uh-uh, not in this house. And out the door it went, mm -hmm. not necessarily back to the pet store. Um, so. Um, the tarantula is showing a number of characteristics of the arachnida, um, such as it has one, two, three, four pairs of legs. That's one of the key characteristics of the arachnids. They have four pairs of walking legs. The body is divided into two regions, the abdomen and the front end is actually a head and the thorax fused together. And it's given a really fancy name, the cephalothorax. Cephalo meaning head, thorax meaning the middle of the body. And that's where all the legs are connected to that animal. The, in this case, the chelicerata come in two different forms. Either they are fangs, 
for their pincers. <laughs> and so you know, those that have pincers for chelicerata, most parts, <coughs> such as the horseshoe crab, they use those little pincers to rip apart whatever they're eating. Um, for the arachnids, a, a lot of them have fangs, and those fangs are used to inject venom into prey. Uh, they typically aren't out to bite bigger animals than themselves, but they do occasionally, and it's usually because they're trapped, and so in defense, they will bite with those fangs. Um, other members of the arachnida include spider mites, and this is a huge bane for um, houseplant uh, people, as well as outdoor plants can get huge population of the two-spotted spider mite. Uh, and the two-spotted spider mite is a huge greenhouse pest. And it has been treated with every imaginable compound out there and is resistant to almost all of them. And that's why it becomes such a uh, bane of how the uh, how to manage them um, on house plants or landscape plants. Now, anybody know what <laughs> landscape plant gets hammered by the two spotted spider mite on a yearly basis? Anyone? It's called burning bush. Mm. What is burning bush? It's a euonymus. Yeah, and the burning bush, um, especially on a hot, dry summer, can get populations of two spotted spider mites on them that'll denude the entire plant. Oh, no. Feeding on the leaves, the leaves will become non functional and they'll just fall off the plant. Uh, or, uh, at minimum, their feeding activity will cause an early color, form, color change in the leaves because typically they're green, but toward the fall they'll turn the bright red color that you expect of burning bush. Um, they can cause that coloration change in the middle of summer, in July, if it's a huge population. Um, the other characteristic of the two-spotted spider mite is everywhere it goes, it lays down a thread of silk. And when you get really bad populations of it, they will encase the entire plant in silk. They don't use the silk for capturing prey because they're plant feeders, unless you consider them capturing their euonymus plant. Um, <laughs> it's more of a protection, uh, a physical protection from predators, uh, physical protection from excess water hitting them, um, but it's a protective layer, and it also helps them find their way back to where they came from. So it's kind of a uh, Hansel and Gretel putting the breadcrumbs <coughs> out. They're putting a silk trail down instead. Scorpions are also in the arachnida. Um, this is not a native arthropod to Ohio. It's more of a southern, southwest desert uh, type of animal, and there are a multitude of different scorpions. Uh, there it is its um, typical characteristic that people recognize the scorpions for, that whip tail with a venom barb at the end of the tail. Uh, but it also has the arachnid characteristics, um, one, two, three. Um, the fourth pair of leg is hidden in this particular case. These claws that you see out front are not, it's chelicerae. Hmm. They're called pedipalps instead. Um, the chelicerae are underneath here, um, and you can't see them in this particular image. Uh, but it does have four pair of walking legs and then this pair of uh, pedipalps. In the tarantula, it has one, two, three, four pair of walking legs, and it also has pedipalps. In this case, they kind of look like another pair of legs, but they're not. Um, so, um, Desert Southwest, again, uh, people can buy different types of tarantulas at pet stores and keep them as an exotic pet, um, as well as occasionally they crawl into crates. And we get a lot of fruits and vegetables from the Southwest, especially California. And they can crawl into crates yeah, before they're shipped out to different distribution centers. So again, if you get something that looks like a tarantula, you probably ought to treat it like a tarantula until you know, excuse me, scorpion, um, until you know whether it is or isn't a true scorpion. 
Um, likewise, if, if you get a tarantula, you probably ought to yeah. treat it like a tarantula yeah. until you know yeah. otherwise. But they don't overwinter in Ohio. No, they cannot survive winter conditions here in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be a very, a very temporary resident simply because it got here at the right time of the year. Or it got here and showed up inside of a warehouse or inside of a, a grocery store and was never exposed to the outdoor conditions. Now, we do have this creature that mm -hmm. kind of looks like the uh, scorpion there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is called the pseudo scorpion. Mm -hmm. That prefix pseudo, what does that mean? False. false. So it's a false scorpion. And notice that it is sitting on a US dime there. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very tiny. What is it lacking compared to the true scorpion? It does not have that whip tail. So there's no whip tail with venom on the end of it. However, it still has venom. Mm. In this case, the venom is introduced through little tiny nipples on the inside of those claws. And they do capture prey with that venom. In fact, uh, that's a size comparison, mm -hmm. just again to tell you how tiny they are. Uh, they do live throughout Ohio. And one of the residents of leaf litter in forested areas, or leaf litter that accumulates in shrubbery uh, in your landscape. So they can be there. But notice how tiny, tiny, tiny those claws are. There's no portion of your body where it can get that claw around anything on you. So we never worry about the venom that they possess. However, here's an example of the pseudoscorpion attacking prey. Mm -hmm. And it's got a hold of its leg with that little claw. And it's introducing the venom into the prey. And it's also hanging on for dear life as that prey flies around until it succumbs to the venom. Mm -hmm. And then it will eat. So uh, that's kind of a, a curiosity amongst the arachnida. Unfortunately, the ticks are also amongst the arachnida. And uh, again, you see the one, two, three, four pair of walking legs. Um, the body, uh, their bodies are a little bit more amorphous. Uh, the abdomen kind of blends right into the cephalothorax. This one happens to be the black-legged tick otherwise known as the deer tick, otherwise known as the lion tick. And so that's one of the, you know, I'm an entomologist. I deal with all of the different arthropods, you know, kind of with fear or impunity. I don't like ticks. The little blood suckers. Um, uh, it, there, there are a multitude of ticks that are common residents of the state of Ohio. Um, the American dog tick is typically the one most people will encounter in this area. I've already had two or three of them on me this spring because I was walking in areas that they would be um, basically hunting for a meal. Uh, fortunately, they usually don't immediately dive in and start taking a blood meal. They do wander around on the host body for several hours before they settle down to start taking a blood meal. In some cases, you know, I, I pick them up in the morning when I'm out taking field um, surveys, doing insect surveys, taking pictures, and I usually discover them in the evening when I'm sitting still and I feel them walking around. And, uh, to get those heebie-jeebies of knowing <laughs> that it's been on you all day. Uh, but, uh, so you do have time to get them removed. Now the big challenge here with the ticks, besides their um, lifestyle that isn't highly appreciated, is they do potentially, and I, I emphasize that, potentially carry diseases that can, in, can infect ourselves, infect our pets, infect livestock, in fact, other wildlife um, with their various diseases. And I've already mentioned Lyme disease with the black-legged tick. American dog tick, um, its typical disease is Rocky Mountain spotted fever. 
Um, we have a lone star tick that's mostly in the southeast portion of the state. Uh, there are several different diseases that are associated with that particular tick. Um, and there are several other species of ticks. In Ohio, there's a new introduced tick in Ohio called the Asian longhorn tick. And that's gonna cause us some concern uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the big reasons, and, the, and not totally un, unencountered in other animals, is it reproduces parthenogenically, which is a fancy way of saying you just need a female. The female can lay viable eggs without ever having encountered a male. And so all it takes is one adult female to initiate an infestation. And she can lay upwards of several hundred to a thousand <laughs> eggs in her life. Um, so, not good news on that front. Another tick to the arsenal there. Um, and of course the spiders are in the arachnida as well. And there's a multitude of different spider species here in Ohio. Um, very, very, very few of them are medically important. Now the two that get highlighted is the brown recluse spider and the black widow spider. Now the typical black widow spider that people think of whenever uh, we mention that group is the southern black widow spider. And the southern black widow spider is the one that has the very, very distinct red hourglass on the bottom of its abdomen. Think about that. How do you see that red hourglass? Well, you have to get her to roll over <coughs> to show you that. Um, that means you've been playing with her to get her to roll over. Um, so, um, but we do have a northern black widow spider it's a little smaller than the southern, and its markings are not nearly as distinct, but it still has that black body, kind of a glossy appearance to it. Um, and unfortunately, one can encounter them out in the landscape, especially under shrubbery in protected areas. So whenever you're working in the garden and pulling leaves and other litter out from underneath the shrubbery, be sure you're wearing gloves so that if you encounter her, she doesn't bite in defense. And if she does bite in defense, then you've got to hit your glove and not your skin. All right. Now, um, some of our spiders do get very large. Um, this is not a tarantula, although when people discover this one, they might think they have encountered it because the <coughs> diameter from tip of foot to tip of foot can be upwards of five inches. So she has a big reach. This is a fishing spider. Now, some of the members of the fishing spiders literally do fish for minnows. So they live around ponds. This one happens to be a woodlot fishing spider where there aren't any fish, but because they're in the same family as the true fishing spiders, they're still called a fishing spider. Now this one I photographed in a metro park down in Miami County. Um, she's sitting on a park bench there. Isn't that uh, inviting? The half of Little Miss Muppet sat on the <laughs> couch. Okay. Um, but the board that she's sitting on, on the bench, is a two by six. And she's reaching most of the way across that two by six board. And I've, I've run into this species multiple times in different woodlots around the state. Um, the orb weavers, like the marble or orb weevil, weaver here is also very common. Uh, we usually encounter them in midsummer through the end of fall. Um, and these are the ones that produce those very ornate pinwheel types of webbing in all kinds of different places. Um, in, in they're not dangerous, even though they are robust spiders. Um, they're very docile. The okay, harvest but, uh, men. Yeah. You're called this a me she. Are the females bigger? I mean, Usually. I mean, okay. I mean, like, can you just tell by looking at them? Um, in many cases, yes. Okay. That the, fe the, the female tends to be bigger in the abdomen because she's got a clutch of eggs inside of her. 
Okay. Uh, the male doesn't have that quantity of gametes in him, so he tends to be smaller, skinnier, um, and less observable in most cases. You know, simply they're there for a short period and then they're gone. Okay. Everything else is up to the female from that point on. Are they usually that col colorful, the orb? Um, the orb weavers? Uh, the marbled orb, we orb weaver, yes. Um, they are striking in their appearance. But there are many other orb weavers that are just different variations of brown. Oh. Yeah. So uh, you do have to look at those a little bit more detail to identify those. Um, the harvestman, otherwise known as the daddy longlegger, <laughs> is also in this group. Now it, it's a little bit different like the ticks in the, the shape of its body. Its abdomen and its cephalothorax do somewhat blend together. Um, yes, they do have a venom, uh, but their fangs are so tiny that nobody has ever been bitten by a daddy longlegger. Uh, the daddy longlegger uh, gets its name from the fact that he has all these very long spindly appendages that will drop off the animal at the, at the blink of an eye. Kind of as a defense. If something grabs a hold of one of those, it will simply shed the leg. Um, and um, there's several different species of them here in Ohio. Uh, here there was a clutch of them. I've seen as many as 40 of them in one spot at a time. Uh, and it's probably some courtship behavior going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they do belong to this same group of the arachnida. This is interesting. Notice one. It has only one, two, three, four, five, six legs. Two of them have already been ripped off. Uh, but all these red spots, may I go back? All these red spots around the body, those are mites that are parasitizing the daddy longlegger. And so a predator has predators of its own. It's kind of like that saying, uh, even fleas have littler fleas and um, other fleas that bite them an infinitum, and it's a longer quote than that. Uh, but it is true. Everything has something that's going to eat it in nature. Next subphylum is the Crustacea. Um, this used to be just a class name, the Crustacea. Now that's been broken into several other classes, um, such as the class Malacostracea, are the true crabs, lobsters, and shrimp. Um, so. Crabs, uh, lobsters, shrimp, um, those are all marine organisms. And in fact, the crustacea rules the oceans. There are no insects that live in marine waters. Because it's already been occupied by the crustaceans. Now, on the other hand, there are a few, very, very few terrestrial crustaceans. Because the insects rule the terrestrial environment. The one crustacean that we have lots of here in Ohio um, is the crayfish um, that lives in ponds, creeks, streams, rivers. And in specific, this particular crayfish um, is the burrowing crayfish. It's the one that produces those mud and chimneys. Um, around lakes, around streams. It can even show up in the middle of an agricultural field. Um, it's not terrestrial. It still requires a body of water to live in. Um, in this case, the body of water that it lives in is the groundwater. It will go down, dig that burrow deep enough to get into the water under the surface of the soil. Um, so. It still lives in a body of water. It is a, uh, it is a scavenger. It comes out at night in search of prey, and then it goes back to its burrow during the daytime hours so that it doesn't dry out. Um, it starts out in a creek, a pond, a lake as an immature, and once it reaches adulthood, it can move out and dig these burrows down into the mud. Um, so that's our, you know, an example of one of the crustaceans that we have here in Ohio. Um, the other types of crustaceans that we have here in Ohio are more, not entirely microscopic, but they're really small. 
um, it's things like the copepods that live in pond water or creek water, et cetera. Very small organisms. <coughs> there is one other crustacean that we'll come back to here in a bit. Um, the barnacle, um, also in the crustacea in the class Cereopedia, um, that is an animal. Um, and that animal is an arthropod. Um, it's a, an unusual arthropod in that it has adopted a sessile lifestyle as an adult. Um, it, the only mobile portion of this animal's life is its larval stage. And when it first hatches out of the eggs, it will um, swim in the ocean waters until it finds a habitat that it's going to settle down into, and then it connects itself to a rock or whatever other object that it has encountered. And that can also be the hulls of ships. And in fact, they can be a huge impediment to a sailing ship to s sail smoothly through the water. It produces so much drag on that hull that every so often they have to be brought into do dry dock and all of those barnacles cleaned off the bottoms of the ships. Now, um, that's been alleviated to a certain extent with more modern ships because they have paints that have anti-barnacle chemicals in them, so they can't settle down on the hulls. Uh, but in days of old, they would cover the entire ship bubble. Um, and how many watched a swashbuckling <coughs> type of movie where the punishment for somebody that disobeys was to keel haul the individual? <laughs> They, they tied a rope to their arms, they tied a rope to their feet, and they ran that underneath the hull of the ship, and they would drag them under the ship and up the other side. That seems kind of you know, bad, being underwater all that time, but that wasn't the punishment. It was dragging their bodies across all those barnacles that were on the bottoms of those ships. So if they survived the keel hauling, they, they were losing a lot of blood because of that keel hauling. They can attach themselves to other animals as well. So there's a crustacean on a crustacean. And everywhere that crustacean goes, the barnacle gets a free ride. They can also attach themselves to whale flukes. So the, the fins of whales can have barnacles up and down the length of them. All right, back into dry land, back into Ohio. Um, a subphylum, the tele, uh, a tele uh, serrata. Um, these have two <coughs> mouth parts. The glass <coughs> diplopoda is a fancy way of talking about the millipedes. Millipedes are arthropodans, um, and they belong into the class of their own, the diplopoda. There are a multitude of different species of millipedes that can be found in our landscapes, in woodlots, around our homes, etc. Uh, most of them here in Ohio are relatively small. Uh, they may be an inch in length as an adult animal. Now this one here is a little bit bigger. Uh, that's probably a good two inches in length, maybe two and a half inches in length, about as big around as a number two pencil. Um, so we do have some larger types of millipedes. Yeah, um, that, that one on the right, I was in South Carolina and there was one like almost six, four inches, six, four to that's six, six yeah. inches, and, and that one, around is a six-year-old. Yeah, that that's the biggest. Is that the one? No, no, this is a oh. different species. Okay. Um, but it looked like that. Yes. Give me a second. I okay, might show sure. you show you the one. Um, here's what most of them look like. Um, this is their defensive posture. If they're disturbed, they coil up like a, a rope. Um, they have their hard exoskeleton to the outside and they have all those legs that they possess to the inside. Um, this may have been the one you were talking about here. Um, this was about four inches in length. Again, about a, a number two pencil around. Um, this one I found in Miami County. Uh, it, it's throughout the state. Um, and you know, I don't have the picture of it mm -hmm. walking. And it, it was about this long in length. And that's about the biggest we naturally have here in Ohio. Um, they are detritivores for the most part. And that's a fancy way of saying they eat dead organic material, mm. plant material primarily. Um, so they are a leaf litter processor. Um, they also get into old, dead, rotting logs. Um, 
And so if you're ever out in the wood lot, you come up to one of these old logs that has been there for years and years, and it's just soft as a sponge where you can take your, your fingers and literally pull it open. When you pull it open, you might find all of these tunnels going through that wood tissue. That was probably one of these millipedes. And partially the shape of the millipede allows them to move through that leaf litter very easily. Mm -hmm. um, it also allows them to push their way through that very soft, rotting wood. Um, they do have chewing mouth parts up to the front, um, so they're processing what they're uh, moving through. And notice the shape of the head is very blunt and rounded. That allows all that leaf litter just to roll right up over top of them. Um, and one of their primary characteristics, as you can see here, they have lots and lots of legs. Um, and so their common name is the millipede. And uh, this will be challenging a little bit. In the metric system, what does milli stand for? A thousand, yeah. And so a millipede would suggest it has a thousand legs. Well, that's an exaggeration. Uh, they can have upwards of about a hundred pairs of legs, but not much more than that. But their class name is diplopoda. Dipoda. That die in metric means two. And what that is in reference to is each body segment of that length of its abdomen, each one has two pair of legs attached to it. So diplopoda. The relatives of them, the class Chylopoda or chylopods, that's a fancy way of describing the centipedes. Right, back to metric. Centi means 100. And again, most of the centipedes do not have 100 pairs of legs. They may have 20, 30 pairs of legs, but not much more than that. <coughs> and one of the big differences, a couple of major differences between centipedes and millipedes, um, centipedes only have one pair of legs per body segment. Millipedes have two pair of legs per body segment. The other thing, the centipedes are predators. And they're built like predators. <coughs> they're built for speed. And they do move very fast. Now, I'm sure you can all attest to how fast a centipede can, can move. And its first pair of legs on its abdomen, you know, first pair of legs, you know, it's not on the abdomen, first pair of legs on the thorax have been modified into a pair of fangs. So they have fangs up by the mouth part that have venom. And they can bite, and they can bite very, very painfully. So it's like a worse than some of your worst bee stings if you get bitten by one. Do they often bite? No. When do people typically get bitten? It's when they're working in the garden and they lean on one. Or they kneel on it. Or it's gotten into a shoe and you shove your shoe in, your foot into your shoe on top of it. So they will bite in the fence. Typically the biting is for prey capture. They are carnivores eat all kinds of other arthropods. Um, and um, some of them are kind of robust, very heavy bodied. Others can be very skinny. And this would be one that has those um, many pairs of legs um, down the length of the abdomen. Now that one you can see is much, much fewer legs on it. Um, they do have the antennae out front. They do have chewing mouth parts and they do have compound eyes. Um, again, they are built for predation. And there's that example of that first pair of legs and the fangs that they can have. Now, this one is an example of an Australian species. And the Australian uh, centipedes are huge. Um, so they're very easy to see that kind of, of characteristic. The house centipede. This is a centipede that literally lives in houses. Um, and 
typically when people see them, they see them one of two ways. One, they've fallen into the sink and can't get out. The sides of the sink are too slippery, they can't hang on. Or they're down in the tub and they can't get out of the tub. Or you're sitting there in your den or the living room and you see this dust bunny running across the, the carpeting. Um, they have many pairs of legs and they're long. Um, they actually extend up above the body and then down to the floor. Um, so they do kind of look like a dust bunny moving itself from one place to another. The cats love to play with them. The dogs will chase them down. Uh, and I have three daughters and a wife. And I get called every time they see one. And I come into the room and say, yep, that's a house centipede. Turn around and leave. To much complaint after I've left the room. But um, they are predators. And they are preying on spiders and other insects that are living inside of homes. So basically, they're beneficial. I can't convince my wife of that just yet. But um, she says if they stay in the basement, they're welcome. If they come up on the first floor, they're done for. Uh, so now there's your silverfish. Now we're into the class Insecta, which we're going back and forth between calling them the class Insecta or calling them the class Hexapoda. In fact, when the, they were first classified, they were called the hexapoda. All right, back to our metric system, what does hexa stand for? Six. Six. So these are the arthropods with three pairs of legs. No fewer, no more. Three pairs of legs. This is one of the quintessential characteristics of an insect. Three pair of walking legs. Now, I just lied to you, because there are exceptions. Now, those exceptions might be in the larval stage. Larvae, in some cases, have no legs whatsoever. But the adults that they become have three pairs. Example, what's a maggot? It's a fly. It is an immature stage of a fly. And maggots have no legs. There are also beetles called weevils. And weevil larvae have no legs. So um, there are exceptions to that rule. But when once you get into the adult stage, they all have three pairs. So here we have the silverfish. We have one, two, three pair of walking legs. Now these appendages out the back are called circe. Um, they're tail appendages. They are not walking legs. And these appendages out front are their antennae. Um, so they, they still only have three pair of walking legs. And this is another building resident. Um, it can be found in undisturbed areas within the home, in the basement, in the attic, in a cupboard. Typically is where they're found, especially where there are boxes, cardboard boxes. Because part of what they eat is the glues that hold those boxes together. Hmm. They also eat the box itself. And there's enough organic material in there that they can digest and get the substance that they need to live. They are a huge bane of libraries. This is one of one of two major insects that can get into libraries and cause significant damage to books, especially old reference books that have leather bindings and glues that hold the binding together. Not the modern day organic glue or non-organic glues but the older glues that held old books together. They will destroy those bindings. And they will also damage the pages um, because the page paper had more organic content in it then than what it has now. So they can do a lot of damage. Um, another um, example, anybody recognize that insect? It's a real common one here in Ohio. Fox elder bug. Now, 
This is the first time you've heard bug come out of my mouth. Every other time, it's insect, insect, insect. This is a true bug. Uh, aren't you going to ask him what's a true bug? Yeah. <laughs> a true bug's an insect. But not all insects are bugs. The true bugs belong to an order called the Hemiptera. And the Hemipterans are the true bugs. And there's all kinds of true bugs out there. Can you name any other true bugs? Ladybugs? No, no. you missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a demerit on that one. <laughs> any other want to try for a demerit? No, I mean... <laughs> What other insects are called bugs? That is a true bug. What? A stink bug. Stink bug? Yeah. Water bug? Uh, there is a giant water bug, which is a true bug. Oh, yes. Beetles bugs? No, beetles are not bugs. No. In fact, that ladybug is a beetle. It's a beetle. <coughs> so we technically should call it a lady beetle, not a lady. Other examples. How about a bed bug? Mm. Yes, it's a true bug. What about a lightning bug? No, that's not a true bug. That's another beetle. How about a potato bug? Nope. That's another beetle. All right, so how do you know whether it's a true bug or not a true bug from its common name. So we have a box elder bug here. Its name is printed box elder bug. Two words. If it is a bed bug, it's bed bug. If it is a stink bug, it's stink bug. Two words. Is that if it's a, calling it a ladybug, one word. Because it's not a true bug, it's a beetle. A lightning bug, one word. Because again, it's not a true bug, it's a beetle. What else do we call a lightning bug? Firefly. Yeah, and it's firefly, one word because it's not a fly either. It's a beetle still, <laughs> okay? What about a dragonfly? <coughs> a dragonfly. One word, dragonfly. It's not a true fly, all right? And in that rule of thumb, if it's not a true type, is used for all of the different organisms, including the example that we have already given here. A el box elder bug. Box elder bug. So what is a box elder tree? Is it an elder tree? It's a maple. So elder is a different group of trees. Maples are a, is what it actually is. So box elder trees are true maple trees. So it's one word, box elder. All right, so that's a true bug. And of course, we have grasshoppers are insects. We have blister beetles that are insects. We have robber flies that are insects. We have butterflies that are insects. Okay, there's another question. Butterfly, is it one word or two? It's one, one word. Because they're not true flies. They are moths. And butterflies, they are lepidopterans. Um, so, um, there's our, anybody know what stink bug that is? Brown marmorated stink bug. Yeah. It's one of our invasive species. What about that? Anybody seen that before? It's a stink bug as well. It's a larval stage of the Excuse me, I used the wrong term. It's the nymphal stage <coughs> of the green <coughs> stink bug. So the adult of this stink bug is solid green, end to end. 
but the nymphs are quite colorful with those oranges and blacks and greens. Um, so um, they do or can change their appearance through their growth and development. So there's the adult. Uh -huh. Those are the nymphs. Aphids. Are those good ones? They're plant feeders. Kind of inconsequential to anything that we're worried about. Aphids, you can see aphids, these are goldenrod aphids on a giant ragweed. They are a true insect. It may not look like a true insect. Um, in fact, um, it, have you ever accidentally run your hand across a colony of aphids when you're doing something in a garden? What happens when your hand goes running across them accidentally? You come back with a handful of goo because they just do not have great physical protection to them, and so they squish very easily. So what happened to their exoskeleton? What happened to that physical protection they got from their exoskeleton? Well, they still have an exoskeleton. It just happens to be incredibly thin. And as a result of that, they would be called a soft-bodied insect because they are very, very delicate. Um, another example, um, anybody know what that is? Hornworm. What kind of hornworm? Tobacco. Yeah. yeah. Tobacco. That's the tobacco, <laughs> yeah. Now the tobacco and the tomato hornworms look very, very similar to one another. They both eat tomato plants, yep. um, but the tobacco hornworm there's a couple of differences. One difference is they have the bright red horn out the back, and their chevrons here, um, on the tobacco, it's just this line that goes forwards. On the tomato, it goes forwards and then back. So it's more of an arrow. So why distinguish between the two? Yeah. Got to be accurate in their identifications. Um, yeah, and so what, why would a tobacco hornworm be feeding on a tomato? Go ahead, say it. Don't whisper. Because there isn't any tobacco. Uh, well, that's <laughs> that. That's kind of an obvious answer. But why? Why would a tobacco hornworm be attracted to a tomato? They're delicious. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> they're probably what they're nightshades and nightshades. Ah. There you go. Tomatoes and tobacco are both in the nightshade uh -huh. family, yeah. mm -hmm. and so they can both utilize tobacco and tomato as a whole host plant. So that's one of that's one of the reasons that we emphasize nomenclature and scientific classification because sometimes knowing that relationship between individuals in terms of host plants if they fall in the same host plant family they may support the same pest species on them so we're not just trying to punish you with all these fancy names of Solianaceae or uh, Lepidoptera or Coleoptera, etc. But there, there's truly meaning behind those words. And that meaning frequently is relationships, how they are similar or how they may be dissimilar, um, such as um, uh, Rosaceae. What kind of plants fall in the Rosaceae? Rose and nymphs and well, you got most of the fruit crops. I yeah. mean, a good portion of the fruit crops fall in roses. Tree fruits, tree fruits, apples, roses. pears, quinces—they're all roses. Yeah. And so, now what might get on a rose could also get on to your fruit trees. Um, one example there is rust: apple cedar rust, quince cedar rust. Um, and hawthorn cedar rust. Hawthorn's another rose. Um, they, they can share that disease amongst those different host plants. So again, there's reasons why we keep doing that, not just to show off, see, I got education, I can tell you the fancy words. No, that's not the reason for doing that. Yeah, 
that those also eat nightshade plants? Yes. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, you know, the nightshade that grows. Oh, you're, you're talking about bittersweet yeah. and poison nightshade, poison nightshade. et cetera. Um, it, actually, the Colorado potato beetle would be a, a better example of mm -hmm. one that eats potato plants, another nightshade, mm -hmm. and it will eat bittersweet and it will eat the, the uh, poison nightshade. Mm -hmm. Now, and I'll put a little little more disclaimer on there. There's actually a false potato beetle and a true potato beetle. Mm -hmm. And their larvae look incredibly similar, except the Colorado potato beetle's larva is orange. Mm -hmm. And the false potato beetle is pinkish. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, they look almost identical. Even the adults look very, very similar. Um, and Colorado potato beetle will infest your tomato plants. Mm. So it, it, it just goes round and round. Will the false do the same thing? Will they eat tomatoes and, and potatoes? I, I can't say that yeah. from personal experience. Um, I've seen them feeding both on nightshade, you know, the bittersweet and, mm -hmm. and the nightshade vine, um, but I'm not sure about the potatoes. Mm -hmm. We don't produce as many potatoes yeah. as we used to around here. Um, in, in fact, down by McGuff, McGuffey, between the onions and the potatoes, that used to be the primary crops mm -hmm. in that particular area, in that muck soil down there. But we don't do that anymore. You know, we produce a little bit of carrots, corn, and soybeans. So um, the, the other reason for putting the, the caterpillar up here, the hornworm, um, is um, it also is soft body does not have very much sclerotized or hardened parts to its body other than the tips of the thoracic legs, and there's three pairs of them there, and the head capsule. The rest of the body is pretty flexible. But don't they really bite? Well, they might bite into fence. If you grab a hold of them, they might rear back. And it really hurts. Well, they've got some pretty powerful mandibles, but it's entirely a defensive mechanism. That's so if you're out there trying to yank them off your tomato yeah, vine, I am. Um, they're, they're gonna, you know, <laughs> fend for themselves. They're gonna I try. Use gloves. <laughs> but and that's probably the best thing, especially if you grab them a little hard and you know, squish their guts all over the place. So but, gross. They but they would get you from their <laughs> mouth parts, right? Yeah. Okay. That horn on the back is ornamental. Okay. It doesn't do anything. The mouth you gotta watch. It's front end. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right, so um, why don't we take a short break here? And we'll come back to looking at some other characteristics of the insects. So, uh, one of the measures of biological success, and, and one of the reasons that the, the insects are considered to be incredibly in successful, is looking at diversity. And diversity is looking at the number of different types of an organism that are out there. And so, this is all of the animal-like organisms that exist today on this pie chart. Um, and we are included there with the mammalia. And you notice that the lion or cat is out here um, and not on the chart because <coughs> that little blue sliver mm. is the diversity of mammals. Mammals are not overly diverse. However, the arthropods start here at the edge of the yellow and go all the way around here to the edge of the burnt orange. Greater than two-thirds of all known animals are arthropods. And of that two-thirds, the vast majority are insects. And so, as master gardeners, what kind of organism are you going to encounter most frequently? Arthropods. Arthropods and specifically the insects. And so you really do have to become accustomed to working with the insects because during the summer, I can almost guarantee you that 70 to 75% of questions that you are going to get are going to be about insects or some sort of insect activity that you have to identify them by. So what makes an insect an insect? And I've given you hints about this already um, with some of the characteristics that we looked at. 
So what makes an insect an insect? What do you look for? Three pairs of legs, absolutely. That is your primary characteristic that will tell you that that arthropod, that animal, is an insect. Of course, some of the other arthropod characteristics that we listed previously, such as the exoskeleton and mouth parts and um, the uh, segmented body, all of those are general characteristics of all of the arthropods, but it's that three pair of walking legs that puts it into the insecta or the insects. So with that, is this an insect? Yes. Yes, yes, it is an insect. I will take it one step further. What kind of insect, in, in general terms, not the specific name of it, what kind of insect? When you look at this image, what's the first thing that pops into your mind as to the type of insect it is? It's a beetle. Okay? You can look at that and say, that kind of looks beetle-esque. So maybe it's a beetle. Here's my next challenge for you. What's a beetle? <laughs> how, how do you know what a beetle is? How do you know what a beetle is? Yeah, that's an arthropod. <laughs> I mean, it has to, it's going to be, have the fangs or so forth to eat what it's bred. Well, it has chewing mouth parts. Yeah, yeah that's a characteristic of beetles. So they have hard shell. Um, they all have that hard exoskeleton, although some people will look at the beetles and say it's a hard-shelled insect. Because when you look at the abdomen or the, the last half portion of the body, it still looks like a hard shield all the way up and all the way down. And that's because in the adult beetle, insects, the first pair of wings that it has are hardened. They are solid. They're not flexible. And that's actually where the order name of the beetles comes from. They are the coleoptera. Coleo means sheath or shield. And optera means wings. So they're the insects with the sheath wings. All right, so of all of the beetles, and I use that term all somewhat loosely, all of the adult beetles have that first wing hardened or solidified. They don't fly with that <coughs> wing. They have a second pair of wings, usually underneath that first pair that are cellophane like. And they'll hold those hardened wings up and out of the way, and the second wings unfold into the wings that are used for flight. And I might have a picture of that here in a little bit. But, um, so the, the characteristic of that hardened sheath or shield um, is you know, descriptive of the beetles. But again, I go back to, how do you know what a beetle is? How do you know? Didn't, didn't somebody have to tell you? You just didn't brilliantly look at it. Oh, that's a beetle out of thin air. Somebody had to have taught you at some point. And it may have been very early in life. You might have been an, a toddler running around in the yard, and our curiosity of looking at everything, and frequently as a toddler, it was in the mouth next to see if it, what it tasted Tasty. like. But somebody was teaching you throughout your entire life, that's a beetle. And they might have told you why it was a beetle. That's a butterfly. That's a moth. That's a fly fly. That's a bee. That's a wasp. So you've been being trained about insects throughout your entire life. Part of it is for survival. Because if you were allergic to bees, you had to know what a bee was. So you didn't get stung. Some of it was just simply avoiding pain. Some of it was, well, that thing's going to suck your blood. Don't let that mosquito bite you. Mm -hmm. So somebody was training you throughout your entire life to distinguish between the different types of insects. 
And if somebody didn't do that for you, you are entirely lacking in your education. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about a pension bug? Are they beetles? They look um, like a beetle. Yeah, it, it, it depends on what insect you're talking about, but okay. yes. A giant pension bug. There are certainly beetles that have their mouth parts that point forward, and they have very big mandibles, and so most likely it was a beetle that you're referring to. Um, so not a bug, a beetle. Um, and so part of the reason for going through this little exercise of challenging you, how do you know what a beetle is, is since you've had this training your entire life, when somebody brings a specimen to you and lays it down and says, what is this? What's it usually followed by after they ask that question? How do I kill it? How do I kill it? Yeah. Um, you have to have a place to start because there's, there's millions of insect types out there. And so if you don't have any idea when you look at that organism right off the bat, you're going to be lost. But if that you look at it and says, well, that's kind of looks like a beetle to me. I'll go to the field guide with all those pictures of beetles in it and see if I can find it. Or if that looks like a butterfly, I'm going to go to the butterfly field guide and see if I can find it. Or that looks like a bee, or that <coughs> looks like whatever. Um, a grasshopper, a cricket, a katydid, a praying mantis, um, you're going to have a starting point for identification. Otherwise, you're going to be lost. If you get an insect and you start going through every individual field guide trying to find an example of it, starting at A every time, you're never going to get to Z um, because there's just way too many of them. So trust that um, non-formal education to at least give you a start as to identifying what you might get to identify. Yes, that is a beetle. And specifically, that is the Asian long horn beetle. A majorly important invasive boar. And you never want to see one of these alive. Mm because our management of it is absolutely brutal to the people that have it on their property. When it's discovered, when it's turned in to the government agencies, such as Ohio Department of Natural Resources, um, USDA Plant Protection and Quarantine, they come out and investigate. If they find it, it is an eradication process. And that eradication process is cut down every single tree that is a potential host to that wow. beetle. Oh my. So there's a host? It's a long list. Long list. Mm -hmm. The primary host is maple. So every type of maple. It also be supported by the buckeye. It will be supported by ash, elm. Um, there's at least 13 genera of tree species mm -hmm. that is supported for the life cycle of this. Mm -hmm. And they are all eliminated from the landscape. Or if it's a forested area, they are all eliminated. So is that in the U.S.? There is one population that we are aware of that has been identified at least a dozen, maybe 15 years ago. And that was down in a little town called Bethel, Ohio, which is about 10 miles east of Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they placed the entire township as well as the county under quarantine in the area that was delimited, delimited, delimited as to where the beetle was located. They eradicated all hosts. They cut them all down. And it hasn't been seen in Ohio since? They have been monitoring that site for years. Every year. They have USDA personnel stationed there. Mm -hmm. And every year they mm -hmm. look for them. Obviously came over and something shipped over. They, they um, have traced it back to the most likely candidate was a business 
that imported tractors from Asia. Mm. And it came in crating material. And the beetle came out of the crates. It, it was still larvae in the wood of the crates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those crates were allowed to lay there for more than a year. Mm. And the beetles came out of the wood and infested live folks nearby to that site. And so is this something that does survive the winter? Or oh, it yeah. It lays its eggs and then those eggs are hatched in the spring? No, the eggs hatch in the fall. Oh, okay. The larva begins feeding in, in underneath the bark of the tree. Um, eventually, it then bores into the heartwood of the tree. Uh, and once it's in the heartwood, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it in terms of management with a, an insecticide. The only way that you get rid of it is to cut the tree down, grind it into pulp, so that there's no piece bigger than an inch. I was going to say, mm -hmm. they, they don't burn the thing? Um, depends on where a population might be located. Mm -hmm. If there's an incinerator nearby, they mm -hmm. will incinerate it. Otherwise, it's just double grinding all of the wood. Are most of the boar beetles then, or is that not true? No. There are a lot of boars that are beetles. Okay. So things like the emerald ash borer, uh, the bronze birch borer, the chestnut borer, the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, there's uh, a, a number, of, a couple of diff big families of boars <coughs> that are beetles. <coughs> However, there are also <coughs> lepidopteran <coughs> Peach tree borer, greater peach tree borer. That is a group of moths called the clear wing moths, the Ciciidae. And the Ciciids, um, there are borers that get into dogwood, maple, oak, um, peach trees, uh, and the list goes on. So there's a, a, a good number of these clear wing moths that when you see the moth, it looks like a wasp as an adult, uh, okay. but the caterpillars are borers under the bark of the tree host that they utilize. Um, there is a carpenter worm, which is a moth. Um, there is uh, the Zimmerman pine moth, uh, which bores under the bark of different pine trees, uh, which is a moth. So there, there's a number of lepidopteran borers out there. So between the beetles and the butterflies and moths are where we find most of the true bores into trunks of trees. Um, another one is a hymenopteran. And that one is the uh, Tremix horn, pigeon horn tail wasp. Um, it's a bizarre little, uh, actually it's a big wasp uh, that gets into a number of different tree species. So, so if these did get into the tree, the way they found it out, the trees were just dying? Is that how they found it? Uh, the, the homeowner where the, the, the primary tree was, uh, the tree had limbs breaking out of it. Um, the tree had a little bit of dead material, but it was highly infested by the um, Asian longhorn beetle. Um, and then somebody will find the adult. And when you see one of these big honking beetles, they don't look right uh, as to where they're found. Uh, the first population that was discovered in the United States was in Chicago, mm. in the city of Chicago. And the way that that population was identified or discovered is a urban forester was driving through a neighborhood and somebody had a pile of wood out by the edge of the road. Um, he looked at it and said, hmm, there's firewood. Asked the owner of it, can I take this? The guy said, I don't care. I just want to get rid of it. So he threw it in his pickup truck with a cap on it. Forgot about it. Next morning, he got into his pickup truck and started driving, and suddenly he had this big honking beetle sitting on his shoulder. And it was the right person to see yes. the beetle yes. and knew something was wrong. Yes. And which beetle was that? The Asian longhorn beetle. The Asian, this yeah. one. Okay. That one, yep. Yeah. And um, the, the weird thing in Chicago, not that I'm familiar with Chicago that much, but um, the buildings there are built in squares on the blocks. And they usually have a courtyard 
in the back of it. Mm -hmm. All of these trees that were infested were inside of those courtyards. Wow. So the eradication process, in some cases, they had to have a crane reach over the mm -hmm. buildings to get a hold of the trees and pull them out. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they carried the trees right through the houses, from the back door through the front door, oh, wow. to get them out of those courtyards. So, but yeah, quite the, the history to those. So, some of the layout of an insect. Um, first thing, the bodies are divided into three regions. And I emphasize regions, not parts, because there's a lot of parts to an insect. But three regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And each one of these regions has functionality associated with it, such as the head is the center of sensory perception. And there are sensory structures on the head, such as the compound eyes. There's a single pair of compound <coughs> eyes. A pair of antennae. So that's receiving all kinds of messages from the environment into the insect's body. The other thing that's up there are the mouth parts. Um, the, the mouth parts, of course, are associated with what sense? Taste. Sense of taste. Um, what about the antennae? What what sense is associated with them? Feel. Feeling? Yeah, we call them feelers, don't we? Yeah. That's a minor sense. It's primarily the sense of smell. There are a battery of chemical receivers on those antennae to smell their environment. So the antennae can smell. Yep. They can also be used for tactile, but it's primarily the sense of smell. So we have the sense of smell, the sense of touch, the compound eyes that are for what sense? Seeing. Seeing, vision. No, it wasn't a trick question. <laughs> um, and the mouth parts are the sense of? Taste. Taste. Okay. So typically we talk about five senses. We um, mentioned four. What's missing? Sound. Hearing. The sense of hearing. And partially, most insects are deaf. They don't hear sound as sound. They feel sound. So when we yell at flies, we say, get out of here, it doesn't work. They don't hear it, but <laughs> that, that, that sound is a wave, uh -huh. a physical wave that can impact on the surface of the body of an insect. And the body of the insect has all these tiny little hairs all over it. And that sound can deflect those hairs. It doesn't hear it as sound. It feels it as a physical touch. And it can react to it. Most insects don't hear. But obviously, there are some insects that use sound for communication. Mm -hmm. Can you name some? Cicadas. Cicadas, absolutely. They have tremendous sounds. Crickets, absolutely. What else? Bees do? Oh, they're, they're bees. That's all they like to try. Call each other words. No. The, the honeybees have a waggle dance. Okay, so that's actual visual? Thing? That's visual. Oh, Vi no, visual okay. and touch. Okay. Now, I mean, if you see them performing that waggle dance, there'll be a whole bunch of other workers basically watching this line dance. Okay. And the way it wiggles and the many times that it repeats the pattern, that that's all visual. And so they, based on those directions that she's producing, they know where to go find the food. Uh, we hear bees buzz. That's just their wings beating. It means something to us. It doesn't mean a thing to the bee. Okay? So no, bees do not hear. So we have crickets, we have cicadas. No, yeah, that's absolutely. It's a type of tree cricket, but it's not uh, katydids. Anything else? Yeah, there aren't many, are Grasshopper? The grasshopper, otherwise known as the locust. Absolutely. Yeah. So there are very few insects that actually hear sound as sound, and those hearing structures are not on the head. If they have a hearing structure, it's often on the leg, such as this um, tree cricket here. Uh, you can see in those red circles, notice batteries are better, I can point now. 
um, you can see the hearing structure. And it is a tympanic membrane. So a tympanic membrane vibrates. So I, when the sound hits it, it vibrates, and that uh, sends a message to a nerve, and the nerve takes that to the brain. So yes, it hears sound as sound. I mean, so you see one on that front leg, you see the other one on this front leg. Uh, when we look at the locus, you can see the tympanic membranes back on the abdomen. Um, for the cicadas, um, you can find it also back on the abdomen. Um, so all of these insects have hearing structures um, that they can hear with. And usually um, it's a male calling to the female, and the female may respond so the male knows where to find uh, the female for mating purposes. Uh, but there aren't many insects that have those structures. Now next, the thorax. The thorax is the center of locomotion. Those three pairs of legs are all connected to the thorax. The thorax is made out of three segments one segment for each pair of legs. There's a lot of muscle inside of that thorax. In addition to the legs, and let's go through the parts of the legs here first, um, you can start up here against the body with a structure analogous to a hip. It's called a coxa. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? If you know your medical terms, uh, the hip is the coxa. Okay. So what's our upper leg bone? Femur is the upper leg part of the insect. What's the main leg bone in our lower leg? Tibia. The lower leg of the insect is called the tibia. And then the foot is called the tarsus. And the tarsus can be made up as of five down to three segments. So there's parts to the tarsus. And then out at the tip may be a pair of claws for gripping onto surfaces. Alright? The other thing that's connected to the thorax are the wings. Once again, I've lied to you a little bit. Notice I've labeled this part as the thorax. That's just the first segment of the thorax. The other two in this case are very tightly held to the abdomen. And the front wing and the hind wing are connected to those second two segments of the thorax. First segment has no wings, the second and third have the wings attached to them when the wings are present. All three of the segments have a pair of legs. And we have a front pair and a hind pair. And this is a beetle once again, so that front pair of wing is hardened. The hind pair of wing is very cellophane-like. And that cellophane wing actually has folds in it that allow it to fold up like a fan and be tucked up underneath that hardened wing. The adaptation for doing that is, beetles are often found on the ground and they're often going down into the soil or they're going through leaf litter. And all of that kind of habitat would be very damaging to a cellophane wing. But if you have a hardened shield over top of it, that protects the hind wing. All right, respiratory system. The, the respiratory system, well, um, back up here a second. I failed to mention the abdomen is the center of internal function. That's where you find the reproductive organs. That's where you find the most of the digestive system, the excretory system, um, the hemolymph of the blood system is found, a lot of it, in that abdomen. There's a very, very primitive circulatory system. Basically, it's one pumping artery that runs down the back of the insect. And a lot of the nervous system is distributed in the abdomen of the insect. And now the respiratory system is also found mostly in the abdomen of the insect. <clears throat> in their case, um, their respiratory system is nothing but a network of tubes. There's no lungs, nothing analogous <coughs> to a lung um, in the insect. And the circulatory system has next to nothing to do with gas transport. Now inside of us, 
our lungs are where a gas exchange occurs, and then it hands it directly off to our circulatory system, and then the blood carries that gas all around the body. Not in the insect. Instead, all of those silvery white lines that you see in that image, and that is a living caterpillar, it is not a, a model. Mm. Um, it has a transparent exoskeleton. Mm. So you can literally see its internal organs through the exoskeleton for this caterpillar. And all those silvery white lines are branches of that trachea system. And we get a little bit closer and look in a little more detail. Notice that a lot of those tubes come right to this foci here. You see a main tube going to the one before it, and the main tube to the one behind it, and another main tube to the one at the end there. Um, those openings are through which the gases come and enter and exit the body, and they're called spiracles. And then all of the little tubes are tracheoli. Um, and in the insect, these tubes keep on dividing and dividing and dividing mm -hmm. until almost every cell in the body of the insect is touched by one of these tubes mm -hmm. for direct delivery of gases. Very efficient system for a tiny little animal. Do we have birds? No, we do not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the tracheal system uh, is efficient enough for a small body animal. It would never function in a body of our size. Or if we had to depend on a tracheal system, we'd be a slug laying on the floor, just <laughs> barely creeping along. It is one of the limiting factors as to how big the insects can get. So rest at ease, you are never going to get this radioactive ant coming out of the crater that's 30 feet long and 10 feet high because it would never be able to exist. It would never be able to be able to pick itself up off the ground. For one reason, the exoskeleton would have to be so thick, it would weigh tons. And then the circulatory system would be so poor, it would not be able to get enough oxygen. We do have fossil records of dragonflies that at one time had three foot wingspans. And I'm glad I don't have that big a dragonfly flying around the pond today, because they were vicious predators. Mm -hmm. They were limited to being about this big as the biggest one. So why could we have huge insects in the past and really small insects today? What's the difference? They didn't have lungs in the past. They always had a tracheal system. What's the amount of oxygen that was in the atmosphere? In the Cretaceous period of the world, the oxygen content was nearly double what it is today. Mm. Yeah, because the earth was covered with trees. Yeah, there was plant material everywhere, and it was just cranking out the oxygen. And we have really highly reduced the amount of forest coverage today. And so the oxygen concentration has been continuously going down and the size of insects kept on getting smaller and smaller. Probably why we don't have dinosaurs alive as well today, because there's not enough oxygen to support that large of a body. All right, back to that exoskeleton from the cicada. Notice that right there. That's a lining of one of those trachea that had delivered oxygen the inside of the body, which says, the tracheal tube is an extension of the body wall into the body of the insect. Um, so there's a portion of it that's lined with exoskeleton or cuticle. And then once you get beyond the main trunks, then it gets down into the more gas exchange types of cells. All right, reproduction in insects. Mostly it's standard. Mostly it is sexual reproduction. There are males, there are females. And the two of them have to get together to exchange gametes to assure the next generation, as we see the two weevils doing right there. However, there are exceptions. And one of those exceptions are, or is, some insects can reproduce parthenogenically. Remember I mentioned that with that Asian longhorn tick? 
some insect species, we have never found a male. The entire population is female. So there's never a male to mate the female, so they lay eggs without a male partner. And an example of that is the black barn beetle. Most insects lay eggs, and the offspring hatch out of those eggs. However, things like the aphids give birth to live young, parthenogenically, no less. Mm -hmm. They hold the eggs inside of their reproductive tract. When the eggs are ready to hatch, they hatch inside and to give birth to live young. The aphids are actually, even as simplistic of an insect as they appear to be, they are really complicated. Because part of their life cycle, they reproduce parthenogenically, giving birth to live young. Part of their life cycle, they reproduce sexually and have male and female aphids that mate and lay eggs. They spend part of their life cycle on a summer host, which is usually an herbaceous plant, and they spend their sexual life cycle on a woody plant. Okay, now I've always heard the biologist, I've always heard only the males have wings. No. Okay, because I've always heard that, like, let me see. It was I... explained to me, it was like almost like the female morphs into a male and flies away. So no. I, that's why I was no. like, I didn't know if that was true or not. No, no, that, that's misinformation okay. and misunderstanding. Okay. Uh, so this is a black vine. I'm coming back to the okay. aphids here. This is the black vine weevil. Um, this is the weevil that we have never found a male in its population. Um, it is a pretty significant pest of a number of different types of ornamental root <coughs> plants, um, such as taxis, or, or yew, taxis. Um, they, the offspring, the grubs of these weevils, will chew the bark off the roots of those plants mm. and just totally strip it. And once the bark is stripped, it dies, and the upper portion of the plant dies. The adult females, when they emerge out of the soil, they will nibble on the needles of taxes and put really neat little notches in the side of the needles to say that we're here. And most of the time, people never see them because they're active at night, not during the day. And so unless you're down on the ground digging around with a leaf litter underneath the taxes, you may never see the female. There's the female giving birth to live young. Mm. She does not have wings most of the time. At some point in their generational development on the host, if they perceive the host is declining, it causes a physiological change in the developing aphids. And when the aphid becomes an adult, it will have wings so that it can leave that plant and find another plant. Mm -hmm. um, and so the females can be winged. When the in, uh, environmental conditions are saying winter's coming, and what usually do you think they would use to know winter is coming? Temperature. Photocuriosum. Why not temperature? Well, just think about temperature in Ohio. It can be summertime in the afternoon. It can be winter by nighttime. It's unpredictable. It's up, it's down, it's sideways. It's every which direction but a continuous in one way or another. Photo period, photo period, day, length of day versus the length of night. I can tell you 50 years from now exactly what day there's going to be 14 hours of daytime and 10 hours of night because it's constant. We have charts that we can follow down through those charts and tell you what the photo period will be hundreds of years into the future. Unless the Earth sl slows down, um, it's a pretty consistent photo period. So you can adapt to that. So photo period in the late fall or early fall will tell the insect physiology winter is coming you gotta change things that's happening. And that photo period 
will determine that some of the offspring will become male and some will become female. And they may both be winged at the same time. And they, may, they will mate so through sexual reproduction and the female will lay eggs on the wintering host that stay there all through the winter and start things anew the following year. So, yes, there are winged aphids, there are wingless aphids, there are parthenogenic aphids that give live birth, there are sexual aphids that lay eggs, and the eggs overwinter from one year to the next. Mm -hmm. A really complicated life cycle. It's not a simple insect, even though it appears to be. Mm -hmm. So there's an example of that, uh, where um, uh, during the summertime, it's all female, and they reproduce asexually. When they get the right signal, some of those female nymphs will become wings so that they can disperse to new healthy plants and continue that asexual reproduction. Uh, and then sometime the photo period will stimulate adult male and female winged aphids to be generated at late in the fall. Uh, they mate and lay eggs at overwinter. And those overwintering eggs hatch the following spring and start the cycle all over again. And that's a simplistic representation of some of these aphids. Most insects do lay eggs, such as the stink bug here, laying a clutch of eggs on the host plant that they will feed on. Um, stink bug eggs are really easy to identify because when you look at them under magnification, they look like each one has a little crown mm -hmm. on the top of it. And when those eggs are ready to hatch, those little crowns pop open like a manhole cover, mm. and the nymph steps out and starts the life of the insect all over again. Identification of insects. Um, this is part academic and part art, and a huge part experience. By seeing these insects over and over and over again, you start developing methodologies for identifying them. And one of them, to me, is looking at the compound eyes on the head capsule. In this case, all of this metallic green appearance here are the pair of compound eyes. So the head capsule of this insect is dominated by eyes, huge eyes. How important is vision to this insect? It's huge. It's its primary sense. Remember, sense of smell comes through those antennae. Those are tiny antennae. How important is the sense of smell to this insect? It's almost non-existent. So, anybody have an idea what kind of insect that head belongs to? Fly. Mm -hmm. Close. Fly is in its name. The other part of the name is a mythical creature. It's a dragonfly. Yeah. The dragon, the, the dragonfly, here's the adult. Uh, the dragonfly belongs to the order Odonata. And there's two groups in the Odonates. One is the dragonfly, the other is the damselfly. Dragons and damsels. Okay? And the dragonfly is the one that has the heavy, robust body. They're big in size, and huge round head capsules with major compound eyes on them. Its counterpart is this one. That's the damselfly. The damselfly um, still has relatively large compound eyes, but they're kind of on pedestals out to the side of the head, and it's very concave in between. Still very tiny, antennae, so vision is still the main uh, sense of, uh, of perceiving the world. These guys are predators. They capture their prey on the wing. So their vision has to be accurate so that they can target their prey while it's flying in front of them. That takes a lot of, of coordination. You see it over here, you target it over here. Just like shooting skeet. If you stop back here, that pigeon's off over there. You have to be able to follow that target across and be able to hit it. And is that's this, what these can do. Is this what they're sh 
huge populations around Lake Erie and all of it? So oh, no, no, that, that's the uh, mayflies. The mayflies. Yeah. This is the Odonata. Mayflies are the Ephemeroptera. Okay. Two different okay. orders of insect, okay. but both aquatic. Okay. Um, these are around your ponds everywhere. So around the river. thing in the middle that looks like an eye is not Oh, how about that? You noticed that, did you? <laughs> yeah. Actually, there's three of them. There's one here, there's one in the middle here, oh. and one over here. And they are called, singularly, it's called an ocellus. Plurally, it's ocelli. There's a little Latin lesson for you. We're pluralizing a word. It's just like alumnus and alumni. Uh, ocellus and ocelli. These are light detecting organs. Mm. Right. It's not. It's not vision. It's mm -hmm. light detecting, mm -hmm. and we think it is associated with flight. It's in a triangle. So if you're flying along and start tipping forward, the two in the back get all the light. The one in the front gets very little. Adjusts. Mm -hmm. You're flying along, and you start tilting off to the side. The one over here gets all the light, the other two get less, yeah. adjust. Tip forward, the one in the front, less in the back, adjust. That's what we think it's used for. And most natural light huh. comes from above. So it keeps a, an orientation. Hmm. If you're, eh, you're probably all of the similar age as myself to remember the Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was an episode on the Twilight Zone where a guy comes running into this diner and the guy's behind the diner with his diner hat on and comes up all flustered to the diner and says, no, oh, the aliens are coming, the aliens are coming. And the guy in the back says, you know, just, just relax, we know they're coming. And he pushes his hat back and he has a third <laughs> eye in the middle of his head. You will find that most sci-fi writers are frustrated entomologists. <laughs> lays its egg inside of the host, it hatches out inside the host, it eats the internal organs, and then bursts forward to a larva that goes running off to find a place to pupate. Yeah, Smatra. Yeah. yeah. So, insects make for great science fiction. They also make for great humor. Um, it, I love the far side cartoons. You know, his subjects were highly associated with insects. And he was educated as an entomologist. Yeah. So there's the damsel fly. Okay. These are the ones that are very, very light body, much smaller than the dragonflies. Um, and uh, of course, we saw the importance of the compound eyes. How about that one? We're looking down on the, the top of the insect here. That's the cicada once again. Mm. Okay. Uh, very um, round bug eyes <coughs> out to the side. There's the ocelli in the middle, um, and that's part of its mouth part there. It's a great big pump for sucking juices out of the plant. Um, so that one happens to be the dog bay cicada. I was going to say, do the cicadas, some of them, don't they have like the orange eyes? Ah, that's the periodical cicada. Uh, <laughs> okay. I've seen some that don't have that. Yes. So, uh, this is the one that we hear every year. Mm -hmm. And the bizarre thing, notice I was very careful not to say annual cicada. I said dog day cicada. Mm -hmm. This is the one that starts singing around the 4th of July and is there until October. It's actually a biennial cicada. There's a brood every other year. So why did we have them every year? There's overlapping broods. Mm -hmm. They just hopscotch one another. The periodical cicada takes 17 years here in the north. There are species down south that only take 13 years. All right, so another example. Now this one, I will confess, it's known more for its long antennae. Mm -hmm. This is a long horn beetle. Mm -hmm. Now, why do I look at the eyes on these and not just at the antenna? 
Can you see these things up here that kind of look like eyebrows over top of its antennae? Mm -hmm. That's an extension of the compound eye. Mm -hmm. The compound eye literally wraps around the base of the antenna. There are species of longhorn beetles where those eyes have become divided completely. So there's a section above and there's a section below. And a, a very common example of that is that black and orange beetle that you find on milkweed, called the milkweed longhorn beetle. It has two sets of compound eyes, one above the antenna, one below. And you know it'll scream at you if you hold it wrong. You're not looking at me like, damn, this guy's got an octa deep down. What's he talking about? <laughs> Who holds? But if, if you hold the body of that beetle, it vibrates, and it will produce a high-pitched squeal. And if you hold it up by your ear, you can hear it oh. screaming in defense. Hmm. Good reason not to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> Do other beetles come to attack you when they come? It could be a bird. It could okay. be any kind of predator, but it is a, a defense against predation. Huh. Um, but that, that's kind of neat if you're out in the garden and you see these beetles and you have bunch of kids around, you grab one of those beetles and say, here, listen, and you can hear it screaming. Do the others all take off then? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they can trans, I, they don't have hearing, hearing structures. Hear the, the sound is to scare off a predator. Right. Hmm. Uh, not necessarily to communicate between the other ones. Now, they use their vision very well. If you approach a milkweed plant and they're sitting there and they see you, they'll fall off the plant. So you have to be pretty quick to grab them. Are these cousins to the Asian longhorn yes, they beetle? Are. Yes, they are. But these aren't as destructive. Different plant. Um, different length of host species. Um, so this one, uh, that's what the, uh, oh, the right. full adult okay. looks like. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all of these longhorn beetles belong to the same family of beetles, and that family is the Cerambicidae. The Cerambicids are borers, all of them. Some of them may be borers in herbaceous plants. Some of them may be borers in hardwood plants, etc. Some of them hit conifers. Um, so it varies depending on the species that you're looking at. Will they bite you when you pick them up? If, yeah, they've got pretty powerful mandibles, as you can see here. Mm. Um, if you hold them the wrong way and they get their mouths close enough, they could potentially bite in defense. Okay. Okay. So anybody know that one? Well, see, you're already getting attacked of identifying things by their head and by their compound eyes. Yes. And here's another question for you. Is there any law that protects this train method? Not here, you wouldn't ask that question. When I was a kid, my grandmother always told me, don't touch them. Mm -hmm. It's illegal to touch them. Oh, wow. It was a bunch of hokey. <laughs> <laughs> it was just to keep me from touching the insects. Or hurting them, yeah. Now, that's actually the Chinese praying mantis. Oh. Yeah. It's an invasive species. Oh. We intentionally brought it into the United States, but it's actually displacing native species of praying mantis. Oh. So we, we brought it in because of its quote unquote beneficial characteristics. Mm -hmm because they are predators. However, they are horrible predators. They will eat anything that flies in front of their face. <laughs> they eat your brothers and sisters. That's the first meal when they hatch out of their egg case. They're cannibalistic. But they don't care what they grab. You know, if it's a butterfly, it's a meal. If it's a honeybee, it's a meal. If it's a hummingbird, it might be a meal. Especially to these big praying mantis. If it flies in front of the face and they can capture it, they'll try to eat it. Some of them have even been found sitting right in front of a bee colony. Oh, wow. And just snatching female after female after female as they fly in and out of the hive. Do they look different than, than our native ones? They'll even eat each other. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, well, that's probably the male. Uh, they take their hands, their life into their own hands when they meet the female. Um, and it is 
true that the females will eat the males they'll even chew their head off in the middle of copulation and presumably they copulate better i guess they're no longer worried about getting their head chewed off mm. but um, <laughs> this is the ultimate sacrifice to your offspring it assures the female has enough protein to manufacture eggs to pass the male's genes along with hers to the next generation. So you were saying... Um, How do we tell the difference oh, between size the invasive wise. and the natural? Oh, color-wise. Um, so the, the brown and green pattern, that's the Chinese. There's a pure green one, mm -hmm. that's European. The American species tend to be much smaller. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I have a picture of one of those in here, but I, I've taken pictures of them. Carolina praying mantis is the typical one. How about that one? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> that one is a fly. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in the tabanid uh, uh, family of flies. They have these unusual, very metallic, lines on their compound eyes. Now, why? Not sure. Uh, it might be detection of different wavelengths of light. Um, why do we see it? It's because of what light gets reflected back. And so it's what we see. It's not necessarily what they see. The tabanids are uh, blood-sucking flies, so they take blood meals to manufacture their eggs. Um, and the big horse flies are tabanids, and during the late August, if you're driving down a country road and you come to a stop sign, you might hear pump, 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 as all these big horse flies are hitting your vehicle mm -hmm. because they can see movement. And if it's a big object moving fast, you might be something to eat. They can detect heat, and so your vehicle's giving off heat from the engine. So between the heat, which may be seen as infrared, and the motion, your car looks like a big animal running through the countryside. And even when you stop, um, if you happen to get out and walk around the car, you might see them on the tire of the car trying to bite the tire. Because the tire is giving off heat as well. So the ones we call like green-eyed flies? Like Tabanids, probably. Um, there's deer flies, which might be what they're calling the green-eyed flies. Um, there are horse flies of several different species, and some of them are huge. They look like B-52s flying through the air. So yeah. And there's the tabanid fly. Uh, that's the horse fly adult, and you can still see that pattern on the compound eye. All right, insect orders. Uh, <coughs> depending on what book you read and what year, um, that number of orders will vary because there are splitters and there are lumpers amongst the individuals that do systematics and taxonomy. And they, uh, through different research, will decide, well, that really isn't a separate order, they go together. And the next generation, they say, well, really, that was two different orders, so they split them apart again. So 31 to 32 insect orders are what are recognized today. Of those 31, there are, you know, the ones that are listed up there are the ones that you most likely can encounter. All right, some of them are much more rare than others. Very quickly going through there, the Columbola, their common name is the springtail. It's a very primitive hexapod. It does have three pair of legs, but in addition to that, it has this tail out the back end of the abdomen that folds up underneath the body and there's a peg right in the middle of the body that that forked tail wraps around. And when they are disturbed, they start building pressure on that tail until it slips off that peg, hits the ground, and they spring into the air. Wow. Thus, spring tail. Are those real legs? No, no, no. These are really tiny. Okay. Uh, and that's an exaggeration in size. Most of them, you have to have magnification to see them. They're really, really tiny, but they will accumulate in very large numbers. There's one called the snow flea. Hmm. It's a springtail that comes out in February and will mate on top of the snow. 
on a bright sunny day. <laughs> and their body color is pink. So it t turns the surface of the snow pink. Um, so a very primitive group of insects. Next, the Thysonora are your firebrats and silverfish. Okay. Um, not a huge order. The next is the Ephemeroptera. That's the mayflies. Mm. That's the one that oh. plagues Port Clinton okay. in the summertime. And that's actually coming up pretty soon here when they come out in massive numbers out of Lake Erie. Um, the next group down, the Odonata. That's the dragonflies and damselflies that we saw earlier. The next group, the Orthoptera are the grasshoppers <coughs> and the crickets. That's what belongs to that group. And ortho means straight. So orthoptera, straight wing insects. Um, so we have grasshoppers and crickets there. Uh, the mantoidae are the praying mantids. Now this is our native Carolina praying mantis. Oh. And it's only about this big as an adult. Okay, so it, here we go again. Praying, it's a mantid. You can say mantis or mantid. And what's the difference? There isn't. Okay. <laughs> it's just whatever term you prefer. Okay. Um, so the mantoidea would say mantid. Okay. And they are winged. Uh, next, the Blatteria, El Cucaracha, the cockroaches. And cockroaches get a real bad name because of four species. The American cockroach, the Oriental cockroach, the German cockroach, and the brown banded. Those are the domestic dwelling cockroaches. But there are a multitude of other cockroaches that have absolutely nothing to do with man-made structures. We do have a native cockroach that lives in Ohio. It's called the Eastern Pennsylvania Wood Cockroach. And it much prefers to do outdoors in the woods. It flies very well. And it will be attracted to porch lights. Or they might be in a wood pile, and when somebody brings the wood in to burn, they will come out of the wood and it's like, ah, oh, where am I at? I went out there. So they never infest human dwellings. Next, the Isoptera. Actually, these two might be combined into one order in the near future, and that's the termites. Mm -hmm. Termites and cockroaches seem to be very closely related to one another. We have one species normally in Ohio, and that's the Eastern Subterranean Termite, and it does eat wood. So when it infests the dwelling, it's there to eat the wood of the dwelling. Or paper products. It, it will get into old newspapers, it will get into magazines, it will get into books. If there's enough moisture in those articles, they will eat those media pieces as well. Um, next, the Dermaptera. There's your earwigs. And I really don't remember earwigs when I was a kid. It wasn't until I moved to Ohio and was involved with entomology that I started seeing earwigs. This is the European earwig. So it may have been recently introduced into the United States and the use of mulch escalated from about the 1980s onward. It provides an absolutely wonderful habitat for earwigs. And earwigs, even though they people freak out when they see them, they have a couple of interesting characteristics to them. One, they can be predators, so they eat other animals that live in the mulch, including slugs and snails, and their eggs. And of all the insects, the earwigs actually give parental care to their offspring. Hmm. They will guard the egg hmm. masses. They will feed the offspring for a period of time until they are big enough <coughs> to go out on their own. Hmm. 
-hmm. And they do live in quasi colonies. They they share common hiding spots. Um, so they might find a bird feeder that's not being used during the summer. Um, they might find a, a bird box, or they might get into an electrical box, or they might get into an air conditioner switch, or they might get in your mailbox, or they might get up underneath the frame of your screen door on your back porch. And when you're the first one out the screen door, you might get a shower of earwigs coming out of that screen door. Um, do they use these pincers to attack? No. They will give a bluff. They will hold the tip of their abdomen up in the air and look like a scorpion. Uh, but these are primarily for grooming um, and lovemaking. Um, so you have the male, you have the female. They can couple together using those. All right, Thermaphrid Amplicoptera. Um, this is an odd group of insects, kind of primitive. They are aquatic. Um, they are an indicator of uh, cleanliness of water. They are very susceptible to pollutants. And um, the, the plecopter or stoneflies, um, these are usually one of the very first insects that we will see active in the springtime. Um, there's a couple of different species that come out very early. Um, next, Cicoptera. These are book lice. Now, calling them lice is a misnomer because usually when you say lice, people think of head lice, pubic lice, body lice, and all kinds of nasty ectoparasites. That's not this group. They belong into different groups. <coughs> the the uh, Cicoptera, or book lice, um, Sosids is another name that they go by. Uh, bark lice, book lice, there's a couple of different terms. Um, they feed on organic material such as the bark of trees, um, things growing on the bark of trees. They do get into library books and can damage pages <coughs> and bindings of books. Um, and they can also get into cereal products. So they can be a pantry pest. Um, they can get into stored grain, especially grain that's got a lot of broken grain in it. Um, they can be a problem there. So um, I found populations of them uh, on trunks of trees, um, and thus their bark lice uh, name that they get. Next one, the hemetron, as I told you before, this is the tree <coughs> bugs. Um, this one is a leaf-footed bug, so the hind tibia is expanded like a dried leaf. Um, next group is the homopterans, and the homopterans are kind of a mis mishmash of everything that didn't belong to any other group. They do have some commonalities, the potato, leaf hoppers, the tree hoppers, the plant hoppers, the cicadas, the scale insects, um, they all occupy this particular group. Thysanoptera, um, that is the thrips, and thrips can be major plant there's an onion thrips that can damage the foliage of onions and garlic. Now there is a flower thrips, which is a major greenhouse pest that can do a lot of damage to plants during the fall, winter, and early spring. Um, and there are even predaceous thrips. Um, the Thysanoptera, um, that literally stands for fringe, fringe winged insects. And so under a microscope, you can see a lot of hairs coming off the edge of the wings of the insect. Uh, very tiny for the most part, and so frequently you have to have magnification to see their characteristics. Next is neuropterans, uh, and the neuro, neuropteran, nerve net wings. And so you can see there's a lot of veins in the wings there, so somebody thought that looked like a nerve network, so mm -hmm. neuro nerve winged insects. Um, this one happens to be the green lace wing, which is a predator. It's a good guy. You want these around. Another one is the dobson fly. And the dobson fly is huge, has really big wings, and its offspring is called a helbramite. And if you're a fisher person on the Great Lakes, you love the helbramites because it's great for walleye. Mm. So, um, next, Coleoptera, that's the beetles. 
and that is the biggest order of insects we have. There's over 300,000 species of known beetles across the world. And there's some 80,000 that can be found in Ohio. Um, next one down, the Mecoptera. Okay, I think this was an experiment. It looks like a scorpion. Mm -hmm. They're called scorpion flies. Um, it looks like it has a horse's head. Um, it does have two pairs of wings, so it's not a true fly. So the scorpion flies, they live primarily in woodlots. And so if you're hiking on a trail, you might see, see them sitting on a leaf in the sunshine. Um, but not many places other than that. Next, Siphonaptera. Notice all of these others are Optera, 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 Aptera. In Latin, A means no. So the Siphonaptera are siphons with no wings. Please. Exoparasites of animals, mammals, birds, etc. Um, this is the adult flea never has any wings. Its mode of transportation is hopping, hopping like a flea, and they can jump a long distance. Um, they can live outdoors, they can live indoors. Any place a host lives, it can live. It is a complete metamorphic insect. We'll come back to that here shortly, which means it has four stages in its life cycle. It has an egg, from which hatches a larva. The larva eventually becomes a pupa. All three of those stages are spent away from the host. They are found in the place the host sleeps. So in the carpet, in the bedding of the cat, in your linen closet where the cat likes to sleep on your, your towels. Um, any place the animal sleeps, you can potentially find those three stages of the life cycle and then the adult is the only stage that's found on the host. And that's the adult. So whenever you're dealing with flea problems, not only do you treat the host, but you have to treat everywhere that host sleeps. The couch, the bed, the carpet, wherever it sleeps. It has to be treated. Next, um, diptera. That's the true flies. And the main characteristic of the diptera is it's the only order of insects with a single pair of wings. That's a huge key to identifying a fly. One pair of wings. All of the other winged <coughs> insects, two pairs. We'll come back to that. Trichoptera, um, this is a um, case bearer. That's uh, another aquatic insect that looks like a moth, but it's not. Um, it's in an order of its own. And the offspring live in an aquatic environment and they spin a silk case around their body and incorporate whatever it's living on into that case. And when I mean living on, what the medium is that it's sitting on. If it's gravel, it's got gravel in its case. If it's leaf litter, it has leaf litter in its case. If you put it on glass beads in an aquarium, it puts the glass beads into its case. Um, so he uses it as camouflage. Lepidoptera, that's the true moths and butterflies, such as the luna moth here. And then the hymenoptera are the bees, wasps, hornets, ants sawflies. So the ants belong to the same order as bees, wasps, and hornets. They have a family of their own called the Formicidae. And it's because a number of the ants produce formic acid as a defensive compound. All right, so how do insects make a living? <laughs> what do they do out there? If you can imagine it, insects do it. Okay, to put it simply. Um, habitat, um, there are aquatic insects such as the dragonflies. These are common green darner dragonflies. They're huge dragonflies. And that's the female back here, that's the male up here. 
and he's guarding the female so that no other male come, can come in and mate her. So she's busily laying her eggs down in the water. Um, terrestrial insects, that's the vast majority of our insects are terrestrial. Um, so when they are aquatic, it's fresh water, not salt water. You might get in brackish water and in intertidal zones, but never out in the ocean. So there is no insect species that lives in ocean water. They can live on the beach, but not in the water. Um, next, food. Um, there are plant eaters, there are meat eaters, there are decomposers. If it's edible, there's probably an insect that will eat it. Some are very specialized, some are very generalist. And then there are some that will cross the entire border. They'll eat meat, they'll eat plants, they'll eat decomposing organic matter. If it's available, they're going to eat it. Um, generalist to specialist, um, that can be in association with all kinds of different things. Uh, it can be what host plants that they live on. Um, it can be what part of the host plant they live on. For example, there are those that are borers. Those are our leaf miners, those that are defoliators. Um, so they cover the gamut there. Life cycles, they can potentially have just one generation each calendar year. So it takes an entire calendar year to complete the life cycle. <coughs> or they can be multi-generational in a single year, such as houseflies. It may only take two weeks to get from the egg stage to the adult. Mosquitoes, it may only take 10 days to get from the egg stage to the adult. And then there are those that take years to complete a single life cycle, such as the cicadas and the periodical cicadas. Most of our insect adults live less than a year, but there are some that live for several years, such as the dragonfly. There are dragonfly species that migrate just like birds. They migrate from the north down to the south and from the south back to the north. There are days there are so many dragonflies in the air that it shows up on radar. <coughs> Most of our insects here in Ohio are seasonal, meaning they're only active for a portion of the year when it's warm and long day length. The rest of the time, what are they doing? What do most of our insects do for the winter? Okay, they go dormant. There's a special word for that. It's overwintering, dormant, whichever you want to use. There are some insects that go dormant during the summer and are only active in the spring and fall. Um, but those that spend the winter are in a state called diapause. And diapause is analogous to hibernation in mammals. It is a physiological determined state of arrest stimulated by an environmental signal. And that environmental signal is usually float a period. Is that for stink bugs? No, actually stink bugs go, uh, they go more quiescent and it's just those dummies that got a little too close to the heat of the interior of the house that get drawn into the interior and then they get active inside and they die of starvation or being squashed and disposed of. All right, so um, we see all kinds of diversity amongst the insects. If, um, you can't get bored studying insects because they do so many different things and there's so many of them that I will guarantee you, if anybody says, I know every insect out there, they are bold-faced lying to you. <laughs> Nobody knows them all. Nobody. All right, insect mouth parts. This is another thing that um, you really need to understand. There are two basic types of mouth parts. There are the chewing mouth parts, and there are the sucking mouth parts. And they cause different types of damages. So here you see a model or a drawing of the insect's mouth. Um, you can see the mouth is down here, and there's actually several pairs of appendages that go into making this chewing mouth part. 
We usually use the grasshopper in biology labs to demonstrate this, and we do the entomological thing and tear them all apart so you can see what all those parts are. And you are not responsible for all these labels. I'm just putting them there so you can see what the mouth is made of. Number one, um, the, unlike ourselves that just have one mobile jaw, uh, the insect has two mobile mandibles that swing side to side. And the, so they're hinged. There's points in the front and the back. Um, but the analogous to an upper lip is the labrum. This is a pair of appendage fused in the middle. It's the covering of the oral cavity. Behind the labrum are the mandibles. The, this is the pair of swinging mandibles. And on the interior side, that's where the grinding occurs to chew up the material. <clears throat> Behind the mandibles is a secondary pair of mandibles called maxilla. Behind the maxilla is the labium. So we have one, two, three, four pairs of appendages that go into making the mouth of an insect. In the middle there, the hypopharynx is analogous to a tongue. It rolls the food around in the oral cavity and then pushes it back to the esophagus. From there, there's all kinds of derivations. So um, over in the middle there, that's the chewing mouth part. And we see chewing mouth parts on mantids, earwigs, grasshoppers, uh, crickets, uh, beetles, caterpillars, and the list goes on and on. Lots of insects have chewing mouth parts. Um, then there's derivations on there, such as the moths and butterflies. If they have any mouth parts at all as an adult, there are many that don't feed as an adult insect. They depend on everything that was accumulated by the caterpillar. Um, but when they do have a mouth part, it's basically a sipping straw. So they collect nectar out of flowers. And when they're not using it, it's rolled up into a coil and tucked up under the chin. The caterpillar has chewing mouth parts. Um, we look at the honeybee. The honeybee has several of those pairs of appendages fused together in a long, lapping tongue, again, to collect nectar out of flowers. The mandibles are primarily used for wax manipulation, to build the combs that they rear their brood, store their food, etc. in. Um, then uh, we go over to the other side of the slide, and you see the term piercing sucking, mm -hmm. okay? Just as, just as it sounds, it's like a hypodermic needle. It pierces tissue and sucks out fluid, piercing sucking. So it's not ripping chunks off and grinding it up and swallowing it, it's sucking the fluid up top. So it's a dehydration. Um, or if it's into flesh and it's taking a blood meal, you may get a reaction to the saliva that is pumped into the wound. So that's when a mosquito bites you, doesn't sting you, it bites you. It, it pumps saliva into the wound, part of which is an anticoagulant, part of it is digestive compounds. That's what stimulates your immune system. Some people are incredibly sensitive to that and a bite will result in a huge, swollen, itchy welt. And then there will be other people in the same place that can be bitten and feel nothing and react to nothing. So it's a sensitivity or hypersensitivity of an individual's immune system. And then on top of that, there are people that are the magnet for mosquitoes. You can be the sole person sitting around the campfire going slap happy because the mosquitoes are buzzing around you and biting at you, etc. And there can be a person sitting on either side of you looking at you and saying, what's wrong with Ann here? She's going crazy. Okay? Do you know why that happens? Well, if there's theories. One can be the chiromone that the person gives off. And a chiromone is a chemical signal that says, I'm good to eat, come hither. <laughs> you just tell people you're sweet, and that's why mosquitoes come to you. Um, uh, it can be your soaps, it can be your perfumes, um, it, uh, it could be the sweat. There's all kinds of potential uh, things that can draw a mosquito in. 
Um, so, yes, there are differences amongst individuals. Some are targets, some are beneficiaries of the target. So, um, so that the mosquito has a piercing, sucking mouth part. The flea has a piercing, sucking mouth part. All the true bugs and homopterans have piercing, sucking mouth part. So there's a lot of piercers out there spitting into wounds and sucking out juices. Um, I like to actually put the third descriptor in there just to remind us of that <laughs> piercing, spitting, <laughs> sucking <laughs> mouth part. And it's that spitting action or injection of saliva that also is the opportunity to vector diseases from the carrier to the host, such as malaria or uh, Zika virus or St. Louis encephalitis or La Crosse encephalitis and the yellow fever and the list goes on and on as to what kind of diseases can be vectored uh, kissing bug, Chavez disease. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what am I missing? Uh, West Nile virus is another one. Eastern equine encephalitis. I've been told, and I don't know if it's true, that the mosquito is on you and sucking. Just let it complete its sucking so it takes some of that reactive fluid back out. Does that make sense? Not a bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not any. No. Uh, and then when we look at the house flies, the house flies have their mouth parts all down to a single pedestal with a big sponge at the end. And they have to sponge up a liquid diet. Um, now, when you're thinking about that, what's it doing sitting on my hamburger bun or on the potato salad? Well, to make sure it has liquid, it's regurgitating saliva oh. on it. <laughs> and the other thing, of course, the, these flies, such as house flies and blow flies, etc., they're called filth flies. Because where were they before they came to your hamburger to sit on it and spit on it? Probably out in the barn. Well, they were in the barn, they were in the backyard on the dog mines that have been laid everywhere, they're in the garbage can and they've been padding through all of that stuff, picking up whatever swill is in those places, and then coming to your food and wiping their feet. Um, so that's why it's important to keep the flies away from your cooking food, because they can carry physically disease on their bodies. All right, from there, uh, just looking at some mouth parts, that's the black carpenter ant. The carpenter ant is a carpenter. It's a builder, not an eater of wood. So what they do inside of wood is scrape away cavities, dwelling compartments. What do they do with the wood that they've chiseled out of there? They carry it to a garbage chute and throw it away. Because they can't digest wood. Termites, on the other hand, are there to eat the wood not to live in it. Now we've seen uh, the, the praying mantid is a predator. It does have chewing mouth parts. It's using them to rip up that cricket it's feeding on. Um, there's lots of beetles with chewing mouth parts and many of them are predators. So you can see they're massive weapons they use to capture their prey. Ground beetles likewise are, are um, predators and have these massive weapons for capturing their prey. Caterpillars have chewing mouth parts, uh, but not everybody has chewing mouth parts. Now this is a soldier bug, which is actually a stink bug. It's a rarity because it's a predator rather than a plant feeder. And it's got its mouth parts extended and harpooned <coughs> this Mexican bean beetle larva, injecting saliva into it, digesting it inside of its own exoskeleton and then sucking out the juices. If you've ever seen Starship Trooper, you know, the main queen, she had those big piercing sucking mouth parts. I tell you, frustrated entomologist. <laughs> the, uh, the cicadas also piercing sucking, and you can see the mouth part there. Uh, and when you look on the underside, uh, when it's not using those mouth parts, it's held between the bases of the legs. Uh, here's a four-line plant bug piercing, sucking through the surface of a leaf of the plant, loves herbs, especially mints and basils. 
-hmm. Fortunately, there's only one generation per year. And once you get through that generation, who cares? And if you're growing mint for your mint mojito, after so many mojitos, you don't care what the leaves look like. <laughs> Um, this is uh, perennial phlox, and you can see these brown spots all over the leaves, and it kind of looks like disease, but it's not. There's the culprit sitting right there, and that's the tarnished plant bug. And those brown spots are the cells that were killed by the saliva that was injected into uh, the leaf. There's the four-lined plant bug. It also feeds on all kinds of weed species. Um, this is mugwort here. And that's the kind of damage it produces. That, those are the nymphs. That's the adult. Even though they look blood red, they have nothing to do with sucking blood. Mosquitoes, on the other hand, do suck blood. And it's only the females that suck blood. In fact, all of the blood feeding flies, it's only the females that take the blood meal. The males do not. Um, and that's because the female has to have all that protein to manufacture the eggs. There's a butterfly using its proboscis to sip nectar, and when it's not using it, it's all coiled up and tucked under the chin. I'm gonna skip over the antennae. Um, just the antennae, there's lots of diversity in shapes, sizes, arrangements of the segments on the antennae. And in keys, you may have to count and identify um, the shape, the number of segments that are in an antenna. And you can see sometimes they're huge. Um, and that's because moths fly at night and they can only smell their host out. They can't see their host, or not host, but their mate. And it's not until they're on top of that mate that they can see them. Uh, wings. This, uh, again, I've mentioned wings a couple of times before, but to emphasize once again, when insects have wings, they usually have two pair. So you can see the two pair, front pair, hind pair. The other thing that I haven't mentioned yet, it also tells you what stage of its life cycle the insect is in. Because wings are only present on the adult. You do not see wings on immatures, just the adult. So if you get an insect in and it has identifiable wings, you know it is the adult. It's at the end of its life cycle. That's good because most of our keys, field guides, etc., are based on the adults. From there, you don't always see that the fact that they have two pairs of wings. This is a lady beetle. It doesn't look like it has wings at all until it's ready to fly holds that front pair up out of the way and flies with the unfurled hind wings, the cellophane wings. Moths and butterflies have two pairs of wings. Sometimes it's hard to see the second pair on some of the moths. Uh, Hymenopterans have two pairs of wings. The cicadas have two pairs of wings. Uh, Hemipterans have two pairs of wings. It's the front pair that you're seeing here. And the, the hemipterans, they're called hemipterans because half of the wing is leathery, half the wing is cellophane-like. The flies are the major exception, one pair of wings. This is a snipe fly. If you've ever been sent on a snipe hunt at summer camp, you should have been looking for a fly. Um, so here's, here's a crane fly. It looks like a mosquito on steroids. And the reason for putting this up here is there's the one pair of wings, but notice these little drumstick-like structures. <laughs> That's what's left of the second pair. And when this flies, that drumstick still beats like a wing. <laughs> and then, of course, some adults have no wings whatsoever. When you see an insect and you can look at it and say, That's an ant. That's always the adult. Whether it has wings or not, it's the adult. The immature stages, you wouldn't recognize because they're grub-like. And when you roll back the log and you see all those white things that all the ants are scrambling around to grab and carry off, those are either eggs, larvae, or pupae. 
if it when it looks yeah, there. They look like natural flowers. Yeah. That's because I those, mean wings. those are the reproductors. Those are the kings and queens. And the kings and queens go off on mating flights. The kings will mate the queens and die. The queens will continue flying off to find a new colony site. And she will establish a new colony all by herself. When she lands and finds that colony site, she rips those wings off. Because she doesn't need them anymore. These are black carpenter ants. These, this is a major worker. This is a minor worker. And all of these winged versions are males. Oh. How can I tell they're male? No, I didn't roll them over and look. Um, <laughs> what I did is just look at the head capsule. The males have tiny little heads. The queens, the queens will be a good three-quarter inch in length and will have a huge head. They'll be bigger than the head on this major worker. So you can see the contrast in head size. Major worker, major <coughs> worker, male, wing. And that's a weird thing about the carpenter ants. They'll have satellite colonies. They'll have a main colony someplace, and then they have these satellite colonies. And frequently, the males are produced out of one satellite. The females are produced out of another. Fleas never have wings. Immatures never have wings. So we have squash bugs here. We have leaf-footed bugs there. Grasshoppers. Now you look at those and say, aren't those wings? No, not exactly. They're wings of the future. They're embryonic wings. They never become fully functional wings until the adult. And the last thing I'll cover, I know I'm running over time here a little bit, and this is important, is understanding insect growth and development. Um, and there's two pathways that most insects will find uh, for going from the egg stage to the adult stage. It doesn't require molting in both cases. Some of our insects don't go through a, a metamorphosis. Um, and things like silverfish and columbula and other primitive insects, they really don't change in form. They just kind of gradually get to the adult insect, and even the adult may molt several times. Then we have the incomplete gradual or simple metamorphic insects, and we have the complete metamorphic insects. And um, again, the examples, silverfish and fire grass, um, they go through molts, they really don't change in appearance at all, they hit the adult stage, they can still go through molts as an adult. Um, they, they just look the same throughout their entire lives. Right incomplete metamorphic, there's a ton of different insects that have incomplete metamorphosis. There's three stages in their life cycle. The egg stage, what hatches out of the egg is called the nymph. It looks like a miniature adult. It eats like a miniature adult. It moves like a miniature adult. It just is not winged, and it's not sexually mature. After the last molt, we have the adult insect. And very quickly, an example, this is a cluster of the eggs that was dug out of the soil. What hatches out of those eggs are tons of little grasshopper nymphs. The mm. grasshopper nymphs go through multiple molts and growth cycles, mm. and eventually after the last molt, they become the adults with fully mature wings, and their activity is to find a mate, to mate and disperse to new sites. And after they have mated, the female lays the eggs back down into the soil. Mm. Incomplete metamorphosis. Complete metamorphosis, now we have four unique stages. The egg stage, the larva stage, which is very worm-like, looks nothing like the adult. Eventually, when it reaches its last instar, it will molt into the pupa. This is the new stage. This is actually where metamorphosis takes place. This is where it changes all of its larval characteristics into adult characteristics. And what emerges out of the pupa, you notice I used emerge. An insect only hatches once, and that's out of the egg. It emerges out of the pupal case as the adult. And so, uh, very quickly going through this, you see a solitary egg, a caterpillar has hatched out of that egg, and a 
second instar caterpillar notices changing its color patterns with each stage but it's still all the same species and those are defensive stink glands and when it gets to these later stages it becomes an eating machine this is where your plant disappears overnight <laughs> literally and then from there it gets ready to pupate and since this is a butterfly it is out in the open uh, it has attached itself with silk um, you see those white lines those are the, the tracheal linings being pulled out there's the pupa out in the open naked so that would be called a chrysalis and then what hatches or hatches oh boy generic for me what emerges out of that pupal case will be the adult butterfly and you can see it beginning to emerge dragging itself out of that chrysalis notice the wings are all crumpled mm -hmm. it literally has to blow those out with blood running out those veins and once it holds it out there they dry then the blood's drawn back into the body and the wing is sealed off mm -hmm. such that if anything happens to that wing it doesn't bleed out mm -hmm. and this is a swallowtail this is the anna swallowtail butterfly and it feeds on um, fennel and anise and several other herbs and spices with that i will draw this to a close mm -hmm. Um, there's a few more pages there, um, basically of insect relatives. I've already gone through most of those um, earlier. Um, if you will take the time to fill out the, the uh, evaluation of teaching, that would be uh, very valuable. Mark will collect those. And if you ever have questions about insects that you're challenged with, um, I do take pictures via email. As long as the pictures are in focus um, and you have some references of to where it was collected and what it was doing or samples can be put in the mail and sent to me via the mail and I do live in Ada and Mark could probably drop it off at my house if you really <laughs> need to. so that's just brushing the surface of entomology it's a big subject for such little animals, uh, but it's an important one, and that is bias. Um, <laughs> I am an entomologist. <laughs> With that, you, thank you for your attention.